Good morning, Sunshine class. It's good to be with you again. It's hard to believe another week's gone. Hard to believe another month is gone. But here we are, the first of November. This has been a difficult November for me in fall because I always look forward to our Christmas play practices and being with everybody. And of course, with Mr. Pandemic running rampant, we can't do that this year. But That'll give us another year to work on one, and next year it'll be absolutely fantastic. You better get your tickets bought ahead of time. So, um, I noticed my brooch today. <laughs> That's yeah. called a public servant brooch. I've been to work already this morning. So, let's jump into uh, our prayer, and then we'll start talking about what Baptists believe again. Father, we thank you this morning for this beautiful day. We just thank you for all the blessings that you gave us, Father. Most of all, we thank you for our salvation. Father, we just pray a special prayer for our nation. We pray for the lost and the sick. We pray for our church, Father, that we would be able to find ways to continue sharing the word. Father, we just thank you for each member, each one that reaches out through the podcast or the what you might call it, I forget what they're called. But you know what I'm talking about. And we just thank you that there's a way that we can still hear the word when we want to. Mm -hmm. Father, we just praise you again in all things and ask that you would forgive us of our sins in words, thoughts, and deeds. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty, this week we're going to take up where we left off about what do, we, what do you believe? And specifically, what do Baptists believe? So uh, we, we take up today article number five of uh, the Baptist uh, message is God's purpose for grace. And of course, we know that grace is a gift that God gives us and because he's, he loves us so much and he just wants to give us something. And we've done nothing to deserve it. We can't earn it. We haven't earned it. Never would be able to earn it. But he freely gave us grace, mercy, and loves us that much. He proved that to us when he sent his son to die on the cross for us. It says somewhere you've heard uh, no greater love than a man to lay down his life for another. Well, just think of what he did. All right. We know that the church, I'm not going to read um, oh, we're talking about, let me back up here. Uh, we're talking about grace here. It says the election is the generous purpose of God according to which he generates, justifies, sanctifies, and glorifies sinners. That means by ways of what happens when you accept him. The, we talked last week about all of those. And... Um, it is consistent with free agency of man. That means that we're free to pick. And if we want it, okay. And if we don't, he's not going to make us take it. Can you imagine how he feels offering us grace and mercy and we turn him down? Uh, you know, there's nothing would hurt your feelings anymore if somebody wanted to give you a wonderful gift and you just pushed it right back in their face and said, I don't like that or I don't want it. I bet you one thing, they'd never get another gift from me. And, you know, this is where God's so much better than I am because he just keeps offering it to us, and we need to remember that. Uh, so um, the second part of that is all true believers endure to the end. Those who God has accepted in Christ and sanctified by the Holy Spirit will never fall away from the state of grace but shall preserve to the end, persevere to the end. Believers may fall into sin through neglect and temptation, whereby they grieve the Spirit. They impair their graces and comforts and bring reproach on the cause of Christ and temporal judgments on themselves. Yet they shall be kept by the power of God through faith until salvation. That's saying when you slip up, and you neglect or you fall into temptation, he's not going to write you off the list like we would be able. If somebody turned their gift down, we just wouldn't buy them another gift, and that'd be the end of that. But he doesn't operate like that, and we can sure be thankful for that. Amen. 
because uh, this says that when you truly believe, you're going to mess up. You're a human being. There's no way around it. You're going to mess up. But he still loves you, and he's not going to pitch you out, and he's not going to mark your name off the list to get in heaven just because you messed up. So, uh, you know, some religions do feel like you can lose that. And there's tons of scriptures in there that uh, will uh, satisfy your mind that this this is the way it says. Mm -hmm. Now the next article we're going to talk about is the church. And uh, there's two ordinances that we observe as Baptists. But first of all, the church is made up of people of black faith. The second part of our church, it's governed by God's laws. It operates under the lordship of Christ through a democratic process. And each member is responsible and accountable to Christ, our Lord. The officers and pastors and deacons are our officers. And uh, both, both recognize, we recognize men and women as being gifted for service. However, the office of pastor is limited to men and the scripture says and I'm going to read something here in a minute and it includes all believers of every tribe, tongue, people and nation so our Baptist church isn't limited to uh, black people or white people not Indians or uh, Chinese Japanese, Russians, anyone it's any believer who believes of black faith can be baptized into the Baptist faith and who understand and also believe, uh, you know, the articles here. Uh, <clears throat> 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7 lists the qualifications for pastors and deacons. And uh, even though it, it says, well, let me read this to you. Qualifications for a pastor and or a deacon. Verse 2 of that says, Above reproach, faithful to his wife, you notice it didn't say wives, it said his wife. Um, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, gentle, not quarrelsome, and not a lover of money, and is able to manage his family. Um, some churches have women deacons. But if you read that scripture there, it doesn't say anything about him or her. It says him. So therefore we can, I feel like that it directly means men or deacons, men or uh, pastors. Okay, now the next article we want to cover is uh, the ordinances. There are two main ones, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And you know, <clears throat> Jesus took part in both of these, and I feel like if they, it was important enough that he took part in them, then we should too. And these are our two main ordinances that we have, and I want to read this to you, because I think it's very important. Christian baptism is the immersion of a believer in the water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is an act of obedience symbolizing the believer's faith in a crucified, buried, and risen Savior. The believer's death to sin, the burial of the old life, and the resurrection walk in the newness of life in Jesus Christ. It is a testimony to the faith in the final resurrection of the dead. Being a church ordinance, it is a prerequisite to the privilege of church membership and to the Lord's Supper. And now I'm going to read to you about the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a symbolic act of obedience whereby members of the church, through partaking of the bread and the fruit of the vine, um, memorialize the death of the Redeemer and anticipate his second coming. And of course, in uh, Matthew 3, 13 through 17, talks about the baptism of Jesus, and then uh, Matthew 3, 26, no, Matthew 26, 26 through 30 talks about the Lord's Supper. And of course, those aren't the only places that it talks about these, but those are probably the two 
that you're most familiar with. You know how um, silly things run through your mind. When I was reading and studying that about the, the Lord's Supper, I thought of the, I saw a little cartoon where the little boy was what, at church and they were having the Lord's Supper and he was making note of everything that happened and when they passed the wafers around, he just stared at it and after church he said to his daddy, he said, that wasn't enough to fill me up, did it fill you up? <laughs> so, and my own grandson, the first time that uh, he came with me and we did Lord's Supper, he said, what are we doing? And I said, I'll explain it to you on the way home. Well, he looked, I let him look at the wafers and then he didn't say a word, just smiled at me. And in a few minutes he whispered and said, is that all you get? <laughs> so we probably want to prepare our children, grandchildren, children ahead of time that, yeah, that's all you get, that's all it takes. So that covers baptism and the Lord's Supper. And these are two very sacred, uh, I don't want to say rituals, but symbolic ordinances that we do and they shouldn't be taken lightly by any means. I didn't mean to kid about it there, but it was kind of funny from a child's perspective what we're talking about. Now then the next one is the Lord's Day. Of course, we all know how special Sunday is for us and the, it's a day of rest. And I wanna to read to you Genesis 2, um, 2 and 3. And on the Sabbath day ended and on the Sabbath day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the Sabbath day from all his work, from which he had made. And then the third one, and God blessed the Sabbath day and sanctified it because that is it. He had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Now, he's a whole lot busier than you'll ever be. And uh, if he thought it was important enough to take a rest, then I think we ought to take it seriously too. And I want to read Nehemiah 10, 31. Okay, and if the people of the land bring ware of any victuals on the Sabbath day to sell, that we would not buy it from them on the Sabbath or on the holy day and that we would leave the Sabbath year and the extraction of every debt. Okay, I think what he's telling us there is we shouldn't be buying and selling and carrying on business as usual. When I was growing up, when I was a child, everything was closed on Sunday. You would better have your groceries, you better have your gas, and I really wish we'd go back to that. And I try, I don't always succeed, but I try to observe that now, of course, I do like everybody else, I fail. And I think about that and I always feel guilty about it and I hope I really do continue to feel guilty about it. And uh, I know in Miss Doris's class one time we had a discussion about uh, people going out to eat on Sunday. You know, we all like to do that and I don't do that anymore because those people wouldn't have to work if we didn't go eat out. And it was it was unique. I forget exactly how she brought the lesson around, but it made a good point. And you know, if you can't do it in six days on that seventh day, you might as well hang it up. Okay, now we want to talk about the kingdom. Okay, this is nothing new. We all know this. We know that God's overall and we know that we, the scriptures tell us that we should live as though the kingdom was here on earth. And um, it's a Christian's um, duty to uh, recognize the kingdom as being sovereign and being supreme and trying to live and have that childlike faith. Uh, let me read Matthew 4, 10 to you. I think I have that mark. And I do. Then said Jesus unto them, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only thou shalt serve. So that answers that pretty good for you. 
He is the one, the only, and the only one that we should uh, worship and try to please. Then we go down to the last days. And I don't worry about this because I figure he's got all that taken care of and that I've got my hands full. It, it does aggravate me when I see things where people are trying to predict when the end of time you better worry about the present time and take care of it and do what you're supposed to do and the end times will take care of itself. And it says right in the scriptures, I've read it and I know you have too, that nobody knows the hour or the time that he's coming, not even the angels in heaven. And you just think about how close they are to him. They're right up there with him and they don't even know that. It says, God in his own time and in his own way will bring the world to its appropriate end. And that's all we need to know. You just need to, uh, my mama had a saying about that. She said, you just need to sweep your own front porch before you start on somebody else's. So that's pretty sound advice. Just take care of your business, what you're supposed to be doing, which is spreading the word and trying to live a life worthy of, of the grace that he's shown you and then all this other stuff will take place. And then the next thing we believe in is evangelism and missions. Mm -hmm. If you don't share the good news, it can't it, it, it can't go anywhere. It's just going to be limited. And that wasn't what uh, God had in mind when he created everything the way he did. He wanted uh, the love of Christ shared. It said the the Lord Jesus Christ has commanded the preaching of the gospel to all nations. It is the duty of every child of God to seek consistently to win the lost to Christ by verbal witness, ungirded by Christian lifestyle and by other methods in harmony with the gospel of Christ. So you've got to share it. And there's countless and endless number of ways that we can share it without standing on the pre, uh, street corner preaching. Of course, that's not a bad idea. But there's other ways. Uh, a lot of times, very subtle ways, just doing a nice gesture for someone. Um, and you can't preach at people. They're not gonna listen to you. I'm not gonna be yelled at. I'm not gonna be told what to believe. Nobody else is either. But there's no substitute for kindness and gentleness and example. Okay, and of course, uh, education is one of the ones mentioned here, and um, it is the Baptist belief that we are to enlighten and to uh, encourage people to read the Bible, encourage people to learn more so that they can share more, so that they understand more. And of course, our church has a strong Sunday school system. We always have a very strong Bible school each year and we are able to witness to a lot of people and you know there's nothing so important as to get a child in Sunday school at a very early age because um, their little minds are like sponges and it's not filled with a bunch of stuff and you need to put the good stuff in and let them soak that up so that they can keep the bad stuff out when the time comes. And that's a good lesson for all of us. I've been to Bible school, I think every year, but maybe two of my life. And it has gonna hurt me a bit because I come away at the end of each week totally exhausted, but it's worth it. Yeah. It's worth it. And you've never been to Bible school till you, till you have a Fairview Bible school. <laughs> that's right. Isn't that right, Brother Razor? Amen. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, uh, that'll conclude today's uh, lessons. We believe in educating our people, learning more. We believe in missions and evangelisms. Our church does uh, good mission works. And um, the Baptist Association has a tremendous uh, mission. Anytime there's a disaster, they're yeah. usually the first ones on the scene. And that speaks volumes about how the Baptists feel about missions. And of course, uh, 
of the kingdom in the last days, that just don't worry about it. You do what you need to do and that will take care of itself. But the next time that you are privileged enough to participate in the Lord's Supper and in a baptism, just stop and realize just what a privilege it is to be a part of that. Um, I think one of the happiest baptisms I was ever at was my own son's baptism Amen. and my grandson's. Amen. And, uh, uh, of course, I was pretty happy about my own, but I was more happy about my <laughs> my child and my grandchildren. So we'll pick up from there, and we'll finish this up next week. And I hope so far you still think you're a Baptist. So I hope, uh, I hope you haven't changed your mind about it. So with that, I thank you. I appreciate your patience and your tolerance and, and uh, try to stay well. And let's have a little word of prayer here. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for loving us so much that you gave your son. Thank you that you made the way and paid the price and that all we have to do is just out of free will accept it, believe it, love it, and follow it. Father, we just praise you and thank you in all things. Amen.